So who am I? Okay, let's start with who, I, who am I? Um, Great for Leicester Medical School in 1989. Um, after doing my house jobs, internship, I sort of left sort of orthodox medicine for a while. Uh, sort of lived in a truck in sort of this country in Ireland for a while. Um, and then sort of came back to medicine in the midnights, worked in London. In fact, I worked in Greenwich A&E about 95 when there was a hospital here. Um, and then went moved to Somerset, was trained, worked as GP, and I've been working in, in psychiatry for the last 15 years. So my talk's really sort of based around my sort of clinical experience, personal experiences, rather than any clear sort of research. Um, yes, yeah, so that's my, my current job. I work as a community adult psychiatrist in West Somerset. Um, I also have some input to what's called a psychiatric intensive care unit in Taunton. I used to, I work, well, I worked full time for several years. Um, and I also work as a, one session a week as a visiting psychiatrist in a, a drug and alcohol rehab unit in Western Supermed. Um, so, what am I going to talk about today? I, I want to, um, <coughs> first half of the talk really is trying to is talk a bit, we often refer to sort of the potential for um, psychedelics or, or drugs inducing psychosis. So I really want to focus a bit more about talking about what we mean by psychosis. Uh, ideas, some more modern ideas about what we call psychosis and, and treatments. Um, and in particular talk about an approach with open dialogue. Uh, then I will talk about it, a bit about the risks of psychosis with psychedelics, um, uh, management of if there is a, a psychedelic-induced psychosis, how that would be best managed. And I did actually mention the body of my abstract, something called Psychonauts Go Psychonauts, but I didn't mean it as my, my title. Okay. So, psychotic disorders, uh, this is a, this is a, roughly, give me, this isn't it, uh, totally exhaustive list, but Think about it as a sort of transient psychotic disorders, um, acute transient psychotic disorders, which generally thinking that it's, it's like to induce psychosis, more that sort of thing. Um, schizophrenia, and then the affective psychosis. The affective psychosis is sort of depressive and manic psychosis. I'm not really going to talk much about that. So, what is psychosis? Losing the plot. So sort of losing touch, we use that term, we use, losing touch with reality, losing the sense of self. And there is neuroimaging showing the lack of connectedness between different areas of the brain in, in psychosis. That doesn't mean it's... I think of psychosis more as a, a symptom rather than the cause. So that's what's the underlying cause that needs to be happening. Um, so, so these are characters, so, so psychosis is characterised by these sort of these different things. So everyone thinks about the voice here in hallucinations, which are predominantly auditory hallucinations. Uh, talk, they can be broken down into different types of auditory hallucinations. Generally, psychosis should talk about third person auditory hallucinations, where there's two people talking about you in the third person. Running commentary hallucinations, where you're being a voice is describing what you're doing as you're doing it. And something called thought echo, where the voices are describing what you've been thinking. Um, then there's paranoid delusions. I mean, paranoid we think of always as persecutory, but actually, in the original Greek, <coughs> paranoid doesn't mean that. Paranoid means grandiose or persecutory. In both states, if you're grandiose or persecuted, you're the centre of the universe. And I think there's, there's ideas around this is a sort of ego defence. There's an ego dissolution going on and a sort of a defence against this, causing paranoia. And then there's delusions around the possessions of thoughts. So that's where you get what's called thought broadcasting, where you feel that your thoughts are being transmitted, other people know what you're thinking, understand your, what you're thinking, other people may be putting thoughts inside your head, or thoughts are being withdrawn. Um, and that, and that to me suggests sort of a loss of self, doesn't it? A loss of your boundary of self. And in the, not necessarily media psych, but in the actual experience of under psychedelics, people will experience something, especially this loss of sort of boundary of self. <coughs> these symptoms are called, these symptoms I just described are called the positive symptoms of psychosis. I remember a patient once saying, well, they're the positive symptoms of psychosis, what are the negative ones? Because it's a bit of an odd term, but the negative symptoms of psychosis are a sort of uh, social withdrawal, lack of motivation, withdrawal, withdrawal from sort of from, from other people, and that's generally described in, as a part of schizophrenia. But, um, if you go back to that sort of what I was talking about, that sort of dissolution of self, uh, and uh, there's lots of 
talk around psychosis being possible sort of spiritual emergence, spiritual emergence, Stanley Scroff used that term, spiritual emergence, spiritual emergency. Um, and that's quite a big topic, but I was just going to use a, sl uh, a quote from Joseph Campbell that I think describes things quite nicely. The mystic endowed with the native talents and following the instructions of a master enters the waters and finds he can swim, whereas the schizophrenic, unprepared, unguided and ungifted has fallen or is intentionally plunged and is drowning. We'll come back to this you the term acute transient psychosis. Uh, so there's an acute onset within, within a couple of weeks. Um, usually there's some big acute stressful event that's happened, a big st stressful life event's happening, or that could be uh, a, a, st a stressful event, a stressful uh, thing happening under, after you're taking psychedelic drugs or taking drugs that could induce a, uh, an acute transient psychosis. That, that picture is often a very, what's called a very florid psychotic picture, it's frequently changing, polymorphic. Someone with then makes good, generally speaking, people with that sort of picture, the acute transient psychosis, is that good, good pre morbid functioning, then they make a good, a good sort of recovery. Um, Whereas schizophrenia, they talk about a sort of more slow, insidious onset with something called a prodrome, which is those negative symptoms, with sort of reduced functioning and withdrawal from, from life, um, poor pre-morbid functioning. And often talk about this family history of schizophrenia, you know, and, and often talk about the importance of the genetic risk. So someone in the family history of schizophrenia and bipolar effects sort of. So general, I think this is perhaps overstated. Um, there's, there's some recent work re-looking at some of the twin adoption studies that suggested the sort of the importance of the, the importance of this, and perhaps they've uh, yeah they've been reinterpreted and, and being sort of perhaps it's overstated. And I must think, imagine, I must admit, in my own practice, I've sort of moved away from this, but I, I see it with my colleagues. Is that you see someone presenting with psychotic symptoms, and well, yeah, their uncle's got schizophrenia, and they're We've got a cousin who's got bipolar, and it's sort of you're damning them before they've got a chance, really. You're sort of saying, well, it's likely they've got an underlying, an underlying vulnerability. Um, and as I said before, it's getting to talk about these positive and negative, <coughs> negative symptoms. The World Health Organization did a, a big cohort study, so they went about 10, 15 years, I think it was, through the 1970s, with eight different centers around the world. The idea was to sort of, uh, and using the same diagnostic techniques for diagnosing schizophrenia across these different eight different centres, and they found this sort of uh, sort of prevalence of one percent worldwide, which was quite massive. One in a hundred people is it, pretty massive. What's interesting is a better prognosis was found in developing countries than the first world, developed world. So all this money, all these antipsychotics thrown thrown at people, and you're actually getting a worse prognosis in, in this country. The, um, so there'll be discussion about why that may be, might be the case in developing countries and other cultures. You've got a, a better family support structure. Um, there's less stigma, so that if someone's voice hearing or having a different experience, they're not just you know in this country you start talking about that people shun away from you, you think you're mad. Whereas in, in other cultures, you may be seen as uh, sort of quite gifted or in contact with the spirit world. Also, interesting ideas. Perhaps the, the, the actual prognosis is worse in this country because of the use of neuroleptic antipsychotic drugs. Ideas that this creates a sort of a chronic illness. Other ideas have been around diet, uh, sort of the refined modern Western diet, lack of essential fatty acids. A lot of interest now in essential fatty acids, fish oils seems to be good for the brain in lots of ways, helpful in uh, mental illness, not just psychosis and depression as well. The, um, just trying to illustrate some of this. I mean, I don't know if this gentleman has schizophrenia, but he's, he's certainly sort of not fitting in with society, sort of a bit shunned, a bit, a bit separate from the, from the rest of the world. <coughs> Whereas this person, who perhaps smokes, you know, a sadhu, smoke cannabis, hear voices, and can't the spirit world, is, is revered and respected. That's just, just illustrating that idea about the sort of different, different stigma in different cultures. So... What causes schizophrenia? The conventional view is it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So it's the inter interplay of genes and environment. So it's, it's very, the other term is a vulnerability stress model. So that if you've got the, the, the genetic vulnerability and then you have different environmental stresses, you have abuse in your childhood, um, 
brain insults, whether that's an infection or something, and then talk about drug use, different, you know, different environmental factors, then develop schizophrenia, um, seen very much as a biological disorder. I think uh, we can get it wrong in mental health. In mental health, we, they talk about trying to get parity with physical health, you know, the same respect for mental health services as physical health services. That doesn't mean that actually we have to break it all down and say it's it'd be so biological about the, cause, the causes and, and treatments of mental health problems. So, yeah, so I mean, the idea, yeah, the orthodox idea uh, is very much that it's a sort of biological disorder and requires drug treatment to correct this neurotransmitter imbalance. The thing about psychosis from a different view, there's this thing called open dialogue. Um, so that's looking very differently at it, really. Psychotic behaviour is a form of communication for experiences that do not yet have words. Hallucinations, unusual ideas, confused states of mind are understood as metaphors for the real events. And long-standing chronic psychotic behaviour occurs due to poor initial treatment um, and part medication, possibly. So medicalisation of that behaviour takes responsibility away from everyone else involved. So in a family or social setting, that person has the illness and it's, it's their responsibility. They're, nothing to do with the, the way we're interacting with them. Yeah, this has been going for 30 years in West Lapland. Jakos um, Sakula um, developed this open dialogue approach. Um, it's been going for over 30 years now. Uh, being developed in Norway, Denmark, Germany, USA. There's currently a, a trial going on with four NHS trusts in the country. There's North, Est North East Lond London Foundation Trust, North Essex, Nottinghamshire and Kent Medway Trust. What is open dialogue? Um, they're the seven core principles of open dialogue. If I, if I talk about, uh, I'll come back to that a bit, but if I talk about what happens in our conventional sort of mental health system at the moment. Say someone has a problem, sees their doctor, gets referred to community <coughs> mental health services, uh, look at the letter, are they for us? Do they meet our threshold? Uh, so, okay, yeah, maybe we'll see them. Well, we can see them in three weeks' time. See them in three weeks' time. There'll be a voice here, a bit of paranoia. Well, we'll get early intervention team to see them. Neil's off till next week. We, uh, I'll maybe get a bit of a lanzapine from Dr. Chris in the meantime. That's the sort of more conventional approach, whereas open dialogue would be you phone up, you make, you know, want to mental health services referred. That day, they'll be in contact with the, with the patient, uh, say, well, we can see you today or tomorrow. Um, who would you like to be there? Who's important in your social network? Family, friends, dog, whoever. Um, should we meet at your house? Uh, would that be convenient? What time should we come? So, and it's usually two or three healthcare workers working with that individual. You're working on sort of what's called an open dialogue, so it's, you're going without preconceived ideas, and you're letting to see... I think there's some similarities with psychedelic therapy in that you are just facilitating what's there. You're not actually sort of asking a lot of questions, you are just seeing what comes up, living with uncertainties and seeing where it goes. And uh, those meetings are usually for about an hour and a half. Um, you would then say, when should we meet again? Meet tomorrow? Um, and the sort of work in, in Finland, I mean, sometimes it's very intense work for the first two or three weeks, maybe daily visits, maybe daily visits for an hour and a half. If you look over a two-year period, though, actually, the period become, you know, if, you, if you're treating it more effectively, dealing with that crisis before it becomes cemented, if you like, if you just, by delaying that intervention, then actually you're developing less chronic illness, and in the more long term, actually, it's less work intensive, but trying to tell our trust, trying to sell this to them recently is just, yeah, oh, it's just it's far too much like hard work. So yeah, these are the seven principle, core principles of open dialogue. So it's that immediate help, looking at social network perspective, flexibility, flexibility in the way you're working, mobility, responsibility, uh, that's with the network and with the, the people working. Psychological incontinence, yeah, that's very important. So it's the same people, those people in that first meeting, it might change a bit, there'll always be at least a core member working with that person all the way through. And that's what people want all the time, isn't it? You hear from users for their health care experience, it's lack of that continuity of care. Psychological continuity, tolerance, that tolerance of uncertainty, living with those uncertainties, because, you know, I think that's the sort of defence of professions, it's like sort of, you know, sort of, you know go in there being very certain, diagnosis, this, 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 uh, but actually being more uncertain and just going where, what, what comes up and dialogism, talking. 
I remember trying to explain this to my 15 year old daughter about open dialogue. She went, ah, you mean talking to people, Dad, rather than drugging them? But, yeah. <laughs> Through the mouth of babes. Yeah. So the outcomes in, in West Lapland are very good. Low, much lower hospital regulation rates, lower use of neuroleptic antipsychotic drugs, about two thirds less antipsychotic drugs used. And just long term or short term, seen as to use short term. Two year, two year follow, 84% of people are in employment education is actually better than their background population in that study. This is very much a sort of, um, there's no control, this is the controlled studies, this is very sort of pragmatic sort of studies they've done. Uh, the, the trial that's going on in this country, those four trusts, they're actually going to be doing a randomised controlled trial looking for more evidence based for open dialogue. So what's that going to do with psychedelics? Well, going back to what, with some psychedelics and drugs and psychosis. I think we all know it's very overstated, but I think already we've heard from the discussion we had early on, but it, we, we recognise it can happen, although albeit rarely. Uh, Terry Krebs is actually here at this conference, and, uh, but there's a great study by Johansson Krebs uh, from Norway, and it's looking at the, um, the US National Survey on Drugs. It's at 130,000 people uh, uh, between 2008 and 2011 and who had used what, we call, what they call classic psychedelics, so that's uh, LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin. And in, in that group, of, well, it's a huge study, 130,000, 15%, I think it's 15 or 14 point something percent, have used those classic psychedelics, and in those people who have used classic psychedelics, they actually have better mental health than, than other people. <coughs> there's, there's lower rates of serious psychological distress, lower, lower contact mental health service, better general functioning, but in that study, it does say, although this is looking at a population, we can't see there's any great evidence for risk, but it doesn't exclude the possibility of indiv in rare individual cases of there being a, being a problem, being a, a psychotic episode. So, psychedelics and psychosis, again. So, talk about therapeutic, I, I sort of talk about therapeutic and, and recreational use. So, potentially, it can precipitate what I've talked about before, an acute transient psychosis. That doesn't mean actually under the influence of the drugs. Under the influence of the LSD or psilocybin, you may be having some quite strange, you might have some voice hearing, this loss of self, you know, uh, these different experiences. It doesn't mean actually that. It means after the drug has stopped working, over the succeeding days, that you get this, this persistent uh, uh, psychotic symptoms. Can it cause schizophrenia? I don't think it can cause schizophrenia. I mean, I don't think the, the, the evidence is there. People who normally develop a psychosis or schizophrenia it happens in their late teens, early 20s, which really coincides when most people are experimenting with recreational drugs. And people, mental health services and family, often are trying to look for a causative agent, aren't they? So John went to university, he was fine, he took some LSD, and he's now got schizophrenia, and it's all the fault of the LSD. But that's a sort of, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an association there, but not a causal, causal relationship. Um, in someone who does have a psychotic illness, or does have a psychotic illness, or perhaps a, a <coughs> later developed psychotic illness, they like, maybe it can precipitate uh, a psychosis. That's that idea. Uh, so, how would you reduce these risks? I mean, say, they, say they're very small, and they don't overstate the fact, I think they're very small. I think we have to. Some people can be very evangelical about psychedelic drugs. Some people think, you know, think it's, it's a panacea for all everyone's ills and everyone should be doing this. And it's certainly not the case. I think it's certainly like mindfulness approaches. Different approaches for different people work. Okay, and if uh, if someone feels comfortable with taking psychedelic, then, then that's good in a therapeutic way. But some people may feel very uncomfortable with that, and it may just be because of, you know, because of these perceived risks, or they might just have an innate fear of it, and they have to perhaps listen to that, listen to that gut feeling they have, or the therapist has. Some people shouldn't take acid, like I said before. And, and thinking, you know, I can think of a friend of mine who, who, uh, who, became, um, who took some LSD at a festival and went really quite mad, and, and you think, God, Jenny taking LSD? It's just the last, just the last person you thought should ever do it, really. But. Set, setting and dosage. I mean, set and setting is, is talked a lot about. Dosage, that's the problem with dosage, is the, uh, with, the, with the illicit drugs, the dosage can be really unpredictable. You're not knowing 
the dosage you're taking, or you've known what substance you're taking. And I refer to the Glastonbury, look, this wasn't the Glastonbury Festival, this was in Glastonbury Town a few years ago. Um, they, there was this mislabeled batch of 2CB, I think, and it was in fact Bremo Dragonfly, which is a very potent psychedelic, only about half, one milligram, and they sort of shared a gram amongst them. And okay, it, was, it was quite horrendous, hospitalisation, uh, uh, seizures. I've read about the similar thing happening in America with a misbased, a, a, a batch of, of Bremo Dragonfly, and there was deaths associated with that. So clearly, uh, there, there's their risks, uh, much more with the fact that it's illicit. But I think it's something in the psychedelic community and as psychedelic therapists, it's, it's something that, that you know, mental health professionals with an interest in psychedelics, actually they'll be well placed to try and help people who do end up falling into, into a problem like this. So, how do you manage an acute transient psychosis precipitated by psychedelic therapy? I say it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a healing crisis, a spiritual emergence. I, I know people, one, one lady in particular who had a group to do with psychedelics had a and acute transient psychosis, and she thinks it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to her, to her life. It just sort of was, it was painful and difficult at the time, but it was very transformative. Uh, and uh, you know, so so it's not necessarily a negative thing. It, it may, you know, it, it's a potential risk, but it's not necessarily a, you know a negative thing if it can be managed correctly. So it's a healing crisis. And as before, it's trying to help that person work through that that acute transient psychosis. Um, there may be a role for medication in that acute transit psychosis. In the, the open, say, in the open dialogue, they normally have a conversation about medication by the third, third meeting, about whether there's any role for medication. And not necessarily antipsychotic medication, just some benzodiazepines, some Valium or some Z drugs, just to help promote some, promote some sleep if someone has been not slept for three days or something. I don't think that the, uh, the people doing the psychedelic therapy should say, well, you know, um, well, this person's ended up a bit mad after this. Uh, they probably had latent psychosis. It wasn't really our fault. And um, pass it to local mental health services and wash their hands. I think it's quite a big ask, really. But maybe if you're going to do psychedelic therapy, you're going to be in the position to manage and deal with something that you throw up. I think you should be, really. But, so, <laughs> how that's going to organise that, I, I can imagine if you're working in close cooperation with your local mental health services, or if you, you know, that would be an option. Because if managed incorrectly, I think it, the, the, okay, if an acute transit psychosis is managed incorrectly, suppressed, say, early on with antipsychotic medication, um, then actually, if it doesn't get resolved, it can lead to chronic problems. Chronic problems. So, nearly there. So, that, as I say, that was what I was titled was Psychonauts Going Psycho Nuts. Psychedelics can, I mean, psychedelics have a low abuse potential, don't get me wrong, but they can be abused. But I mean, working with people, especially working uh, at rehab, some people will just take anything they can with. They want to get, you know, for, for often because of different trauma, different things in their life, they'll use alcohol, different things, and include other people to take acid, mushrooms, whatever is, whatever is going, if you like. Uh, and it's heavy use of psychedelics and then not being clearly I was talking earlier on about sort of assimilate integration or assimilation. If you're, taking, if you're not assimilate integrating properly in between usage, whether that can lead to problems. People, I mean, Frederica said it well, really, that actually it's only facilitating stuff from ourselves, isn't it, really? But people can believe that the psychedelics are giving them some, some answer, <coughs> provide the answers rather than realise that what they're doing is, is they've got to find the answers within themselves. I had a, uh, I worked with a chap who was in his 40s, who grew up in Glastonbury, happy, happy parents, lovely chap, and he sort of was using psychedelics from a young age and just, you know, take five, at 15, talked about taking five microdots. Because it's that sort of, that, that wonderful experience where you think you're sort of getting this understanding of the universe, that's what he talked about, and he, so he wanted to take more and more because he wanted to understand the universe. And he realised, it took him quite a few years to realise that he couldn't, and he's... Perhaps develop some chronic problems now, really. He does have some chronic paranoia problems and massive conspiratorial ideas. I see him every month or two, and he's an interesting chap. <laughs> but, um, and potentially, as I said, those, if you develop these sort of, you know, if these, these episodes aren't managed properly, you can develop chronic problems and maybe get a diagnosis. I'm not saying it causes schizophrenia, but some people may end up with this diagnosis. So, 
last slide, just to throw a span of the words, people all say about not using psychedelics in, in sort of in schizophrenia and stuff, but it has been used before. Um, I can think of people who are, if you, they'll be diagnosed as say paranoid schizophrenia with residual symptoms, who are chronically unwell and they're on lots of medication and nothing is working and maybe it's a kill or cure situation, maybe, but maybe psychedelic therapy may be helpful in that situation, but that's been quite controversial and I can't see anyone want to go, go there yet. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>